from the chair. From the chair. Welcome back to A View from the Chair, a show for all Memphis citizens. We like to give our listeners and viewers, let me tell you, listeners and viewers, for the very first time, or if you've been following us, the latest on this beautiful city on the Mississippi River. So getting right to it, I want to, you to know Joining us today from the University of Memphis, and back in my day, it was Memphis State University, are Dr. Brian Waldron, the director of Caesar, and South Houston, the associate director of education and outreach of Caesar, is a multidisciplinary research center that focuses on, guess what, water geographic analysis, transportation, and education. The center has been researching Memphis drinking water source for over 25 years, and they're here today to discuss just right here a view on the chair. And the other person is Sarah Houston. I didn't say her first name because you probably <laughs> thought Houston, Texas, but it's Sarah. So Sarah, I appreciate you being here with me today. And Dr. Waldron, I appreciate Thank both you. of you. Uh, welcome to another great day in Memphis. Jazz, America's own original musical art form. When did it start? Who were and are some of the major players? How do you distinguish what kind of jazz you're listening to? Riffin' on Jazz is your weekly visit with friends talking about this music we love. Join Howard Robertson and me, Malvin Massey Jr., as we explore this fascinating and entertaining genre of music. We talk about the great and lesser-known artists, songs and tunes, the instruments and the social impact jazz has had on world culture since its beginning at the start of the 20th century. Riffin' on Jazz on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! So I want to start off the show today so you all can just share with the audience who you are, where you come from, what's going on in your world, and then we'll get right down to the topic, the Memphis Aquifer and our water. So, Dr. Waldron, you want to start off? Uh, sure. Uh, I am a uh, native Memphian. I grew up near uh, Lichterman Nature Center and graduated from White Station High School. And uh, just as yourself, I am uh, familiar with Memphis State University where I graduated from college and then went away for my uh, doctorate somewhere else in Colorado. That, so that says something glad about to be back your age. Look, that says something about your age. <laughs> young, young at heart. Young at heart. Uh, lots of experience is what it really comes down to, right? Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, um, like Traylon Robinson alluded to, my name is Sarah Houston, and I'm from Houston, Texas. Yes. Um, but I moved to Memphis about a year and a half ago, actually, to take this job. Um, I've been a water nerd for about 10 years. I really want people to just kind of have that connection to, you know, this most vital resource that we all need to survive. So um, I came to Memphis because it's got some of the best water in the country, and we want to keep it that way. Awesome. So what makes you think that our water is some of the best water? You can go to other places. Um, I'm actually in Florida right now, and the water has a sulfur taste to it. And, you know, it's always great coming back to Memphis because of the quality of water that we have. It is so so special in that way. And it's, uh, it's really special because of where it comes from. Uh, it comes from underground. A lot of people used to think it came from the Mississippi River, but it doesn't. It comes from underground. And uh, when you say that, sometimes people think it's this giant lake under underground or a giant pool of water. But really, it's just sand. Um, it, it's a huge, huge amount of sand, and the water fits in between all the sand grains. So it's like a giant sand filter, and that's what makes our water uh, so of such high quality and tastes so wonderful. So, very special water source. So, you're saying that our water is special uh, because of the way the water and the sand interact in the earth? Yes, it's it. Uh, it's 
by pulling the water through the sand, it's filtering that water and the sand is quartz. So it doesn't pick up, the water doesn't pick up anything about the sand itself. This is different than uh, out east where you get surface water. Uh, when it goes through uh, caves out there, it picks up all those minerals and you can taste all those minerals. But here it's just quartz sand and the water doesn't pick anything up. So it comes straight out of the, straight from underground at high quality. Okay. So do we have uh, natural whales or do we dig for it? How, how do we get that water out of the ground? Sarah, you know? Yeah. So um, we do. We had to drill deep wells um, and they're, they're actually powered by pumps. And so they kind of just look like pipes in the ground, but they've got a big machinery on top of it. And that's actually pumping that water up to the surface. And then from there, it goes to a water treatment plant where it's kind of further cleaned out, aerated to get some of the iron content out and just a few things added like chlorine and fluoride. And then it goes to our taps. So kind of like what Brian said, you know, places that get their drinking water from surface water. Think about when it rains, when it storms, there's all kinds of stuff kind of running off the road. That's going to go into a river real quick. But here in our aquifer, it takes a long time for that water to filter down. Okay. So in other places, where do they get their drinking water? Since ours is coming directly out of the earth, it's naturally filtered. So you're in Florida. Where are they getting their water from? <laughs> In Florida, they're getting it also from underground. It's just that the geology isn't sand, it's, it's caves. And therefore, that's, uh, well, they get it from different places. But in the central part of Florida, they get it from caves. And uh, as Sarah was saying, water gets in real quick. And anything that's runoff or things like that is going to find itself in the water more quickly. Whereas our water, it takes thousands of years uh, to actually get to us. Okay. So, Sarah, what's going on down in Houston? Where do they get their water from? Good question. They actually get it from a couple different sources, both uh, river water and aquifer water, since the city is just so big. They've got multiple sources. Um, but since they're so close to the coast, when you pump up a lot of the aquifer, a lot of that groundwater, start to get some of the ocean water to infiltrate in, and the land will actually start to sink. And so they're dealing, dealing with some major issues down there, more on the quantity side, trying to make sure that, you know, they're number one, not running out. And number two, they're not doing major damage to the land to where that aquifer will never refill. So let me ask another question now that you mentioned that we're so close to the Mississippi River. Will we ever have a problem? We don't want the muddy Mississippi in our water. So how do, how do we keep that from happening? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Actually, we're the largest city on the Mississippi River that relies solely on groundwater, only aquifer water. Um, so, you know, we're really fortunate to have just that access to it. Places like St. Louis and New Orleans, they don't have a big aquifer below them like we do here. When you taste the water and you visit other places, what's the difference in the taste? Well, I mean, everybody tastes something different, uh, but I guess you would say almost we don't have a taste. There's nothing about it that that tells you, oh, I, I taste a, a, a like a sulfur taste to it, or um, I taste some kind of mineralization. We don't really have that taste, and that absence of taste uh, almost kind of gives you this this mindset of wow this is really a high quality nothing in it kind of water and that's about what it is so uh, i guess it's more of an absence of taste which is kind of an odd answer to your question i guess <laughs> well to kind of add to that too it's also like not necessarily just the taste but you know, think about when you're taking a shower or doing dishes you know, when you live in places that have that higher mineral content, like Dr. Walter was saying, you get stains. You get stains in your bathtub. You get stains on your shower curtain, on your dishes. And here, you know, Memphians don't really experience any kind of hard water stains. It's, it's you know, doesn't have much in it besides H2O. And so it's just kind of flowing right through. So back to the question about, uh, I mentioned the Mississippi. So 
how is our water actually being replenished since we're not it's not coming from the mississippi river it's coming from water under the ground are you saying that we just have an overabundance of water and we don't have to worry about that for years to come great question <laughs> um, so you know rainfall really is key so we still rely on rain but it's not the way you would think so if you go out if you go out east towards Fayette County, the aquifer sands actually come up pretty much to the ground surface. And so rain will enter in there, but to travel all the way under to the city of Memphis, it'll take two to three thousand years for that one water droplet to move that far. So we've got a lot of water and it's taken a long time to get there. But if we continue, if we would pump too much water, then we would start to see those levels going really far down. So mm -hmm. rainfall is where we're getting our water. But we also have, like you said, kind of a surplus because it's been there so long. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were trying to explain this to a kid in the third grade, because I expect teachers to show this video th while they're at home. Uh, this fall, teaching students to share about the water of Memphis. What would you say to a third grader about where we get our water from? Uh, how long is it going to be around? And, and what can they expect? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll take that one. I'm the, I'm the education nerd over here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the first thing we want students really to understand is that, you know, our water is coming from underground we have this resource that you really can't see. And so it's kind of hard to understand, but we want kids to understand that when that rainfall falls on the ground, that it's precious. Whatever is going on on the ground will eventually affect our drinking water supply. So the cleaner we can keep our community, the cleaner we can keep our water. Oh, so when we trash our community, we can have an impact on our water. Sure um, can. That's something I want citizens to know. <laughs> yeah. We need to clean up Memphis because we want to make sure we have good water all the time. Yeah. So I didn't realize water has an age. So we have age water that we're drinking on a daily basis. And over time, we're getting more and more of that age water. Is that what you've explained to us today? When you think about uh, water, you don't sometimes think of age. Sometimes you think of of something else that you would get at age two, but we are able to identify these signatures in uh, the groundwater that we have that were man-made long ago. And what it does is it gives us an age saying, are you really old or are you really young? And what's interesting to us is the young water. We we uh, believe or, or have identified that the age of water beneath Memphis is around two to 3,000 years old. But when we see water that is 13 years old in our groundwater supply, that's a red flag. It's like, wait a minute, that's supposed to be like thousands of years old. How do we get 13 year old water in our drinking water supply? And the red flag is that this, this aquifer that we have another reason why it's special is it has this clay layer sitting on top of it and that protects our drinking water from pollution um and above that clay is another aquifer it's really shallow we don't really use it but there's no clay above it so it gets more prone to contamination well when we say 13 year old water what's happening is that there's a hole in that clay and the water from the shallow is now able to get through that hole in the clay down into our drinking water supply and that's what we start pulling out so identifying where these breaches or holes are in the clay is very very important for the long-term sustainability of our groundwater in memphis so is that why we have a concern or overabundance of concern on water quality right here in the city of memphis yeah, you know, you kind, of, you kind of mentioned that, um, you know, we've got a lot of water. We're very, very fortunate to have that much water. And we do have really great high quality water. But like Dr. Waldron said, we're starting to see this younger water. And usually younger water has man-made pollutants in it. And so younger water can t potentially be, you know, more contaminated. And so when you think of 2,000-year-old water, 
you know, there's not going to be any man-made chemicals in that. That's why we've got some of the best water in the country. And so what we really want to know is, you know, where are those holes in the aquifer? Sorry, the holes in that clay layer. Because okay. when we identify where those holes are, then we know those are areas that might be a little bit more vulnerable to having that poor quality water enter into our drinking water system. And that's something that you're watching every day. Is that, that correct? Correct. So yeah. the, our Memphians, well, let's, let's, so we can make sure that they understand this. What can Memphians do to help protect our drinking water? We don't want to be like some cities that we've heard in the past and they're still struggling with drinking water. We want to make sure that our water is safe, that it's good water, just like it is today, and that we have years of that to come for our children and their children's children. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, that's a, part, a really important question. I mean, just having these kind of conversations and having people, you know, learn about where our water comes from is, you know, one of those first steps. Um, but a lot of times, Americans, you know, we really take our drinking water supply for granted. You turn on the tap, it's pretty much going to flow out and you're just going to flow out in really nice quality. And so there's a lot of different things we can do, you know, Primarily, I'll talk about the, the quality side, and I'll let Dr. Waldron talk about the quantity side. But, you know, some things that just citizens and Memphians can do is really dispose of household waste properly. Talking about, like, oil or paints or batteries, you know, some of that toxic stuff that we use every day. You know, instead of throwing it in your trash can or dumping it down a storm drain, you know, take it to, take the oil to, like, a Jiffy Lube or an Auto Zone where they're going to dispose of it properly or your paints or some of your chemicals, take it to Shelby County's hazardous waste facility and drop it off there. They're going to make sure that it's going to a facility that would never impact our water quality. What about the oils that we use to cook with, like olive oil, vegetable oil, and I know canola oil is a vegetable oil, but we use those different oils. What should we do with that, and how does that impact our water? From the standpoint of disposal, um, you know, those are not petroleum-based, so they're not as impactful as a uh, car leaking oil. Um, often the oil that you may wash down the drain uh, will end up going into the sanitary sewer system and it's treated by the city of Memphis before it's ever released uh, back into the environment. Uh, there's bacteria that the city of Memphis uses to treat the wastewater. Again, those aren't petroleum based oils. They're not as bad as the car oils, which you do need to dispose of properly. You know, one thing to be aware of, because we sometimes talk about these holes and we talk about contamination and it gets people a little worried. One thing everyone in Memphis needs to be aware of is that all of our utilities like Memphis Light, Gas and Water and those other municipalities in Shelby County have um, water quality testing labs and they regularly uh, test the water to make sure that what's going into the pipes is of the best quality and they watch for things. Uh, to uh, make sure that nothing is happening uh, detrimentally to the aquifer. Um, and we work closely with them on that. Uh, Sarah mentioned the quantity piece. And I, I really think we take our water for granted in Memphis, which is unfortunate. We have so much of it, about 57 trillion, trillion gallons beneath us, just in Memphis aquifer. Um, you think, oh, wow, we got a lot. We're doing good. We actually have some of the lowest water rates in the nation. Uh, but we still take it for granted. I mean, how many times can, can we virtually raise our hands and say when it's raining outside, we see businesses uh, with their sprinkler systems going while it's raining? <laughs> or or, we, or, or we'll, go down, we'll go down the street and, and we see water going down the curb and we're like, where's that coming from? It's like someone's sprinkler is just going and going and going and it's just running off into the curb and going down the inlet. And it's, it's sad to see, um, you know, so if we can take conservation measures now, uh, even in the home, if you're brushing your teeth, do you really need the water to keep running while you stare at it, going back and forth on your teeth or up and down? Okay, and now you're stuff. stepping on my toes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a flick of the wrist. It's a flick of the I'm wrist. Just... And then you <laughs> turn off that tap. <laughs> I'm all my water running. <laughs> 
<laughs> it doesn't need to just turn the water when it doesn't need to be being used. It'll go a long way. Yeah, we're going to be working on you, Miss Chairwoman, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, you know, like Dr. Walden said, it's those little small actions. When uh, one person does it, but then that one person is a whole bunch of people, the little tiny actions, they really do add up, you know? You all have brought <laughs> so many uh, points and things to light that, you know, as a citizen, and I'm just a regular, ordinary citizen like everybody else, and we have some bad habits. And today, I hope that our conversation will get Miffians thinking about how we protect our great water, how we use it, and, and how we try to uh, consider those things that you talked about today. Uh, so when I talk about the oil that we use in cooking, we don't want that even in our sewer system. We don't want any petroleum-based oils in our water and in our ground either. But what can you say to Nifians? Uh, we have a lot of organizations that are really interested in saving our aquifer and we have uh, for generations to come and we want to continue to have great water. So what are some of your closing comments about what we can do and how we should take care of our water and how we should better appreciate it and especially the low cost? You know, we are trying with our center, Cedar, trying to do public forums. Uh, and outreach to talk about where our water comes from and its importance and taking advantage of that opportunity to hear about that would be would just be good information is uh, is, is a great source um, for action so you know Memphis always is kind of we're, we're the special ones in Tennessee you know we're, we're a little bit different than the rest of the state in a lot of ways and uh, you know this groundwater resource is really special to West Tennessee once you kind of hit that West Tennessee mark, you know, the majority of this region is depending on this water source. And so I think, you know, for local Memphians and, you know, our region as a whole to really learn more about this, learn more about the potential risks that are coming down the road. And so that, we, you know, we can let the rest of the state know, that, like, we really need to manage our water resources in a way that's going to sustain us for generations to come. Now, I have one last question and and to me this is really important when we are approached by saving our aquifer and and we're having battles with uh other organizations using our water with the state of mississippi saying that we're taking water from them do we do we actually share water with them or do we have our own water can you all just give us an idea about what are all these battles about our aquifer system uh, underlies portions of eight states. So it is a massive, massive aquifer system. And therefore, when you think about that, it is a shared uh, resource. Um, so the battles that are going on, like the state of Mississippi with Tennessee and, um, uh, you know, this idea of who's using the water and how much, down to the necessity for everybody to get into a room and uh, chit chat and uh, try to work things out together. Um, and we're all talking together instead of, you know, maybe in a courtroom or some other <laughs> more adversarial means. So, do you have any closing remarks <laughs> like to share, like to share, Sarah? Um, well, I mean, thank you so much for having us on and having taking your time, you know, to speak about this. So, you know, just thank you for doing that. And you've always been, you know, stayed up to date with a lot of the, the water stuff. And, you know, it's as an elected official, it's really important to do that. I know y'all are, you know, have to be experts on every issue ever. <laughs> so, you know, just, you know, keep in yourself appraised with this kind of stuff, you know, really means a lot to, to us and, you know, to the future, the future of Memphis. So, um, Thanks for having us on and letting us, you know, say our piece and educate all the listeners and viewers. <laughs> That's correct. Thank you. <laughs> I want to say I appreciate both of you today. And uh, I appreciate you, Dr. Walden, for sharing your time. And uh, we're jealous that you're down in Florida and we're in Memphis, Tennessee. So you just be safe while you're there. 
I'd like to also thank you, uh, Sarah, for sharing your thoughts and being sharing with our young people so they understand the importance of keeping our water clean, our community clean, so that we'll have water for years to come. I like the way he said funking around. Yeah, that's what they're doing. I, I did like that, but he said the old. I'm gonna start using it. He said the old elector is funky. Well, basically, it's what he's saying. He's saying that they. But no, I said they're funking around, and that's true. With our, with our future, Be, because in, in it's 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 known, and I think you absolutely don't the let midterm them, elections. Don't let them always funk up the future. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Well, I'm, I, I am certain that we want to uh, continue this conversation about clean water, uh, about the great taste of water that we have here in Memphis, and that we want to be more thoughtful about our environment and the aquifer that we have right here in our own community. I want to ask that all the people who are listening and viewing on today that you make sure you continue to listen to via all of our podcasts uh, so you can hear about the latest things that are going on in Memphis and a view from the chair on any of our podcast podcast uh, platforms. And uh, if you desire, hopefully, Next time you come back, you can share some of those charts and graphs you have shown with me. Uh-huh. Let's get shared <laughs> with me and the community and even a piece of the video that we've done so that we can share that with the community as well. Yeah. So I'd like to say good evening. See you next time. I'm Patrice Jordan Robinson, Memphis City Council Chairwoman representing District 3. And you've been listening to A View from the chair see you next time a view from the chair from the chair from the chair recorded at Kudzukian Studios directed produced and distributed by Kudzukian mm-hmm.